We might be patient while others are becoming impatient. We might be impatient while those around us are perfectly calm and wondering why we're getting upset. So the key thing to remember is that patience and impatience being feelings mean that they arise within the mind and we have control over what goes on in the mind. Or at least with practice, we can gain control over what goes on in the mind. So tonight we're going to look at patience with self. An interesting subject in a Buddhist setting because Buddhists might say, well, there is no self, but we'll avoid getting too deeply into that. Let's just say that what they're saying is there is, of course, a self. You are really sitting there. You know, if you want to check it, you can just, oh, yeah, I am here. But the Buddhist view of self is just not as we usually view self so that they begin to minimize and ultimately become released from that sense of I, me, mine, everything is about me. Which of course it isn't, in case you haven't noticed that. <laughs> so, in this um, Hot Off the Press book, in the chapter called Patience with Self, for many of us, the most difficult person with whom to be patient is ourself. Our pride, personas, and ego can feel disrupted and threatened every time we feel we have done less than our best. Buddhists call this aspect of ego, Mara, the enemy of spiritual growth. Mara exists within us all and seems to have a particular affinity for undermining patience. Mara opens the door and invites impatience to arise by diverting our eyes from truth and making it difficult to see things as they really are. When Mara gains a foothold in this way, patience can quickly be lost and irrational thoughts, words, and actions can emanate before we have a chance to think, or so it seems. When this happens, we can so easily rationalize that we deserve our own annoyance. We speak to ourselves with a level of disrespect that we would rarely, if ever, inflict on another. The reality is there are times when we are unskillful. We simply don't perform up to our own expectations, the expectations of others, or our own self-image. We might have spoken to a loved one or a colleague in a manner we later realized was inappropriate or unkind. We would like to believe we are more skillful in our endeavors. We envision ourselves as more spiritually advanced to the point where those slip-ups wouldn't happen. Yet they do, and we feel deeply disappointed and annoyed with ourselves. Getting down on oneself rarely produces anything positive unless it happens to lead to determined resolve, which is difficult when the mind is bridled with self-criticism. Over time, we see that just being impatient with ourselves rarely leads to anything beneficial. When feelings such as anger and hatred arise, they can be fueled by distortions and mental images that we create and accept as reality. The Buddha referred to this phenomenon as delusion. It can happen quickly, and when it does, objectivity is lost. We do not see things as they really are, and thus wisdom cannot prevail. For this, meditation is an ideal practice. In meditation, we can bring the mind, we can bring to mind a situation that caused anger to arise. We then focus directly on the experience of that anger and its related thoughts, 
feelings, and physical sensations. There is no way to rush this process. We just stay with it. We keep returning to the thoughts, feelings, and sensations as they arise in the mind and the body. <clears throat> People sometimes say of themselves, I'm not a good meditator. So, what is a good meditator? A good meditator meditates. Beyond that, opinions among the world's masters vary enormously. Don't be concerned about learning how to meditate. The practice is not something to learn. It is something to do. With the doing will come the learning. It's an oddity because with just about everything else that we've ever learned, we sit down and we study and we learn. We were taught how to do that as children. Right? Eight times eight is 64, nine times nine is 81. You spell automobile, A-U-T-O. And you learn that way. Meditation is really learned in the doing. Sometimes the doing is bumpy and sometimes it's kind of smooth and delightful. Now if we're going to speak about patience with self, at some point, the subject of the body is going to come up, the ever-changing, impermanent body. Some of you might remember this because one or two of you might have been here when this happened. I recently asked a room full of meditators how many with, were happy with their body exactly as is and wouldn't change one thing about it. There was then a room full of smiling meditators and considerable laughter, but no one raised a hand. <laughs> Diets to lose or gain weight are part of the American way of life. If diets don't work fast enough, there are drugs to stimulate or depress various glands and organs, supposedly leading to weight gain or loss at a more rapid pace. Skilled surgeons have busy schedules making body parts larger, smaller, firmer, or rounder. Yet the body continues to age and will eventually die. No scalpel can cut through reality. Our relationship with the body we inhabit will last the entire length of our life. Wouldn't it make sense to become friendly with that which is always, literally, around us? Without an attitude of graciousness, or at least acceptance, we may find ourselves living in a state of low-level dissatisfaction and impatience. Sometimes we may be too busy to notice, but other times we may feel downright disgusted with our appearance. With the commercial world bombarding us with reasons to be dissatisfied with our face and form, it can be difficult to appreciate the beauty of our being as is. Comparing yourself to others is meaningless. Focus on the beauty of you. Let there be a lightness about your being. See the bizarre nature of things we do in our pursuit of happiness. Lightness encourages patience. As E.E. E. Cummings said, the most wasted of all days is one without laughter. As far as we know, we get only one body, so might as well figure out how to be happy with it. And if you're not, don't worry, it's changing anyway. Now, as I said, if we're going to speak about self, we should really have just a word about the concept of no self, but we'll stay sort of on the periphery. An open beginner's mind is a powerful tool for developing patience. Notice if you tend to be curious and remain open-minded about thoughts that are different or in opposition to your current views. 
Or do you quickly reject that which doesn't come easily or immediately seem right? Recognizing that we resist the new and different can reveal insights about our issues with patience. And as I have pointed out several times and will be pointing out over the next few months, as we go into the election season, you are going to have many opportunities to hear views that are different than yours. See how you handle that. See how patient you might be. That doesn't mean don't go out and do something for your candidate. Do. Support your candidate. Speak up for your candidate. And just as you would like others to listen to your views, see how good you are at listening to the views of others. It doesn't mean you have to vote the way they do. Just see what it is like to try to listen to those other views. So at the end of each chapter in this book, there is um, a little section called Contemplations in that pretty gray box. I was actually wondering the other night when I was speaking about this, if you, if you download this into your iPad, I'm wondering if you could change the gray to some sort of pretty pink or something like that. I don't know, actually have to try that. Anyway, after the Contemplations, there are some actual practices so that you can begin to work on your own practice of patience. So, this contemplation was offered by the Buddha. Looking after oneself, one is looking after others. Looking after others, one is looking after oneself. How does one accomplish this looking after others by looking after oneself? by practicing and developing mindfulness, thus encouraging it to grow. How does one accomplish this looking after oneself by looking after others? By practicing patience, compassion, and loving kindness. I know not of anything that brings such happiness as the mind that has been brought under control is well attended and restrained. Such a mind does indeed yield great happiness. Now it takes patience to develop patience. And there will be times when you have been trying to be more patient, you've been working on exercises from this book or other sources, and yet you find you still slip up. So the first practice in this book addresses creating your motivation, but creating in a sense of looking to see if it's really there. Do you really want to put in the work to become a more patient person? So, happiness, inner peace, and patience begin with taming the mind. The mind's incessant tendency to jump from thought to thought, feeling to feeling, can be brought under control. We do not have to be governed by the mind's random nature. Make the practice of mindfulness the ground upon which you will build greater patience and inner peace. Commit to taking time each day to sit down, even for a few minutes, to practice detailed awareness of the workings of your mind. Just be aware. Don't judge. It is a sophisticated skill and takes time to learn, but even your initial efforts can yield benefits. Let go of thoughts that will lead to suffering and distress, and welcome thoughts that will lead to happiness. While ultimately patience is practiced in the company of others, the starting place is in your own mind. So why don't we take just two or three minutes and see what can be accomplished if we take a look at what's really going on in the mind. 